Welcome to the Robustly Beneficial uh, podcast. Today we will talk about a paper called We Built AI, a participatory framework for algorithmic governance. It originated from a uh, CMU. Can you give me an university? Yeah. <laughs> Which is a university uh, in the US, one of the, the, the main universities in, in uh, computer science. And uh, this is my favorite paper of 2019. Like, um, I, was, uh, well, I was extremely excited when I discovered this paper. I think it's extremely well written. Uh, like the introduction is, uh, is, is, is really amazing. Uh, and the content of the paper, what they did and all is uh, extremely complete, uh, much more complete, I'd say, than uh, what everything else that I've seen so far. Uh, I think it's really like a great framework like to, to, to include a lot of the difficulties of uh, algorithmic governance. Um, which by that, what, what they mean is like, uh, well, the design of uh, like governing algorithms, I guess. Uh, so what they, they think about is like many algorithms that are used to, uh, to for many users. Um, uh, th this can be like a garbage collection for a, a, a city or, or stuff like this. Uh, but they also have in mind, uh, like there was one sentence in particular, which was quite, uh, they, they gave quite uh, some emphasis on this uh, sentence about uh, the role of uh, social media uh, algorithms, uh, which I found very exciting, like that they had this in mind. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, the use case uh, they present uh, is uh, also a very cool one, like it's about food donation. And essentially the problem of food donation is you have these food uh, donors who uh, have leftovers, so typically uh, uh, supermarkets who have uh, leftover, leftovers, and uh, they want to give it away uh, as a donation, uh, but uh, it, well, if you just this company, this company who wants to give food away, well, you don't know to whom to give this food away, and so there's this uh, uh, intermediary uh, NGO uh, called 412 Food Rescue, I think something like this, um, that is uh, essentially uh, organizing the dispatch of the the, the food to, to to give it to uh, organizations uh, in need of food, and you can think that this. Uh, um, it, well, like, first of all, it's a very nice application, like it's a very human, humanitarian application, but it does raise a lot of, uh, of uh, ethical dilemmas um, that may not be, like, well, essentially every time like there's a food donor that say, I want to give this away, there's this question of who will this food uh, go to? Mm -hmm. And uh, you can think of each decision as a small ethical dilemma, uh, maybe it's not exactly a question of life or death, but this happens a lot every day. And so the accumulation of this makes it uh, an important uh, challenge. Uh, and, uh, and, and, what, and what's interesting is that so far, uh, this challenge was uh, resolved by a, a human worker who was basically choosing whom, to whom the food is going to go to. But what they wanted to design is an algorithmic solution because uh, well, they had the intuition that the algorithmic solution could uh, improve both eff efficiency and uh, equity uh, of fairness. I think they use both terms. Um, well, by efficiency, what they mean is like the food uh, being transported on the minimal distance. Uh, so this, well, you can think of this as a, a requirement for less gas uh, consumption, for instance, but also like to to optimize the human resources because the dispatch is done by by humans. And if they can uh, dispatch more food, in a sense, or with less work, then um, there's gain. Yes, also these decisions, they were taken by humans and they report in the paper that each uh, volunteer had to, to go through 100 uh, questions per day of yeah. uh, this food should be dispatched where. And, and this, took, this take too much time. I, I, I yeah. imagine that it takes at least uh, half a minute to, to make the decision of that food should be dispatched uh, to this place based on all these features that are important to, for this decision. So it's uh, nearly one hour per volunteer per day yeah, was required. And it's also not scalable. If suddenly we want to do 10, 10 times as much decisions, then we will definitely need 10 times as much humans to do it. Yeah. So th that's also one, one place where replacing the human decision with an algorithm, if the algorithm takes as good decision as the human, yeah. is definitely a... Uh, 
already one way to do more good yeah. out of the box. Yeah, that, that's uh, and, and also, so there's definitely this point, there's also the question of fairness, mm -hmm. because if the human is taking the decision, maybe he's going to have some bias. Uh, probably he's going to have some bias. Yeah. So one of the bias they saw is that uh, a very large proportion of the donations were given to a very small proportion of the of the possible receivers yeah. and there was not it was not very spread through and somehow this is something that when they ask uh, participants later this is not something the participant wanted yeah but it's something that they were doing in practice without uh, truly realizing that it was happening this way. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, very hard to, <laughs> to think about the things you're not able to think about. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's uh, very interesting. And uh, in a sense, you, well, the, go the whole goal at least was to, to design an algorithm that was better, both more efficient and both uh, more fair. And, uh, but then this raises the question, this raises the question of what does it mean to be fair? And we all have this intuitive uh, feeling of what a fairness might mean, but uh, it's, not, uh, it's not that easy. And actually, there's a lot of research about what uh, we mean by fairness. Um, there's uh, this concept called individual fairness, this other concept called group fairness, um, and there's other, conce co other concepts uh, of fairness. And, what's, uh, and the, the, the approach so far to the research on fairness, which, uh, of which there has been quite a lot of, uh, the, the approach so far is that essentially some scientist is going to try to formalize this concept and he's going to come up with one theoretical definition and then he's going to develop algorithms to, so that they can uh, be fair in this sense. But um, yeah, is this the right uh, definition of fairness and thus will the algorithms actually be relevant for the actual definition of fairness? It, it's not that okay. clear. And what's more, in fact, uh, well, sociology shows that uh, the concept of, of fairness is not like there's not one concept of fairness and there are different concepts of fairness and uh, different people have different concepts of fairness and uh, this varies uh, culturally. Um, and so one, so, so one fair solution it may be uh, designed uh, in the Silicon Valley may not be fair in, uh, in the sense of, uh, of, uh, of uh, people in Switzerland and may, which, and may not be fair in the sense of, uh, of China or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one idea here, which, uh, which is a very interesting idea, is to adapt the concept of fairness to the actual users. Um, so you might call it, uh, what I like to call it, user-driven ethics. Uh, as opposed to uh, software developer driven ethics, I guess, <laughs> who, uh, or company driven ethics. Uh, and it, it, it sounds like uh, it should be more relevant. Um, it's, well, in a sense, that's, uh, that's mm -hmm. maybe what most of us feel intuitively is better, like to include people's notion of fairness. But it's also more efficient. Like, even, even if you're a company that just wants to deploy uh, your algorithm and what, what you want is the, for the algorithm to be used. And if you want the algorithm to be used, uh, even if the, your goal is to make money, uh, mm -hmm. if you want your algorithm to be used, it's actually probably better to give it the ethics of the people who are actually going, going to use it than to uh, impose your own ethics. Yeah. Maybe it's a good time to introduce the, to describe the framework they, yeah. they had in the paper. So the framework they, they, they propose is in, we can say, two parts. One part is where each individual interacts with a, an algorithm. Yeah. And the goal of this algorithm is to learn the preference of, uh, of each individual. And each, each one has one specific, uh, let's say, parameterized algorithms that, that we work for them later. And then the second part is uh, a part where all the algorithms from each individual would together, uh, for example, make votes to, to take decisions uh, collectively. And, uh, and this, this is how they, 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 they implemented what you were describing as a, how to make algorithms more fair. In, the, their, in their solution, it's a get somehow everyone's opinion altogether. And the way to, to get this uh, fast uh, and at scale to make more decisions than uh, we, we could if we were just querying humans is, is that the human train an algorithms and then the algorithms can uh, make a, thousand of votes per minute. Yeah, okay. yeah, because you can imagine that, uh, as you said, like each volunteer had, has a hundred uh, choices to make every day. Yeah. If you multiply by the number of uh, volunteers, that makes, uh, I don't know, like 
well, let's say thousands of, uh, of decisions to be made every day. Mm -hmm. And maybe ideally, if you like, uh, you think that democracy is the ideal uh, for these kind of decisions, then you would want to make a democratic vote for each decision. Uh, but this would take like uh, yeah, the day would be over before you start uh, uh, having uh, enough answers. Uh, so you, you don't want to actually do a democratic vote on each choice. And the idea is to replace each uh, voter by uh, what, what I like to call a, an algorithmic representative, uh, some algorithm that will play uh, the role of the voter mm -hmm. and we hopefully vote like the voter. And if you think about this, this is very similar to uh, uh, representative democracy, uh, which is uh, the norm in many countries in the world uh, these days. Um, the problem of writing laws, for instance, is uh, that, uh, yeah, we could try to do it purely democratically, but if we try to write a text of law all together, like uh, 8 million of Swiss people writing together, it would be a huge mess. Uh, and most, partly because also like most people just like don't understand everything or I surely don't understand enough of the law to be writing laws. And instead what we're doing is we have representatives that uh, write the laws for us, like we vote for the representatives. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, actu in the representative democracy, the, the, these representatives are, are humans and they have to be well, there are not that many representatives for the whole population, which means that it's not that clear that the representative will actually represent uh, adequately the person who voted for this representat representative. Yeah. Yeah, when you're voting for a presidential uh, candidate, uh, maybe you don't fully adopt all of the ideas of the, probably you don't fully adopt all the ideas of the presidential uh, candidate. So the presidential candidate does not fully represent what you, what you want. Mm -hmm. And the hope here uh, is that if you use algorithmic representatives, it can be uh, fully customized so that it actually really tries to, 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 to learn uh, your preferences and act according to your preferences. Yeah, so the way they did this in the, in the framework is that the, the user and their algorithmic representative would be iterating uh, over time. So, for example, the so there, there, there are two ways to build the algorithmic representatives. One was using machine learning that observes comparisons that the user would input. And uh, the second one was using a purely rule-based where the, the user would have to write down the parameters of the algorithms and decide on uh, what computation to make to, to make decisions. And in, the, in any case, the algorithms would be trained by the users, then the users would be would see what result the algorithm gives. So on this comparison, our the algorithms gave a such result. Is that in line with your with your opinion? And if not, then the user was able to continue training its its own algorithm. And uh, also iterating between the two methods, it would give the users a, a clearer view on uh, how how this this thing works. Yeah, uh, maybe just clarify the what we mean by a comparison is that. Well, uh, a use case like typically, uh, the, the, you have this donor that wants to get food, uh, and here are two options. Which one do you think is better? And you have all the the features of the parameters of the different options. Like maybe on this uh, on this first choice, like you have data of like the last time it was given food, uh, the the distance to, to travel, uh, how big uh, the organization is. Um, uh, like also I think about uh, the economic uh, status of the region like uh, is it uh, a, 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 like an underdeveloped area of the mm -hmm. city and stuff like this and yeah and based on this like every time you say well I prefer to give it to this or to this and then you have this uh, machine learning algorithms uh, which is not a very sophisticated it's like logistic regression mm -hmm. is uh, what we've well, we've discussed a bit of this in a previous podcast uh, about uh, preference learning from comparisons. Um, but yeah, uh, you have this that learns essentially from your, your comparisons and the other ways you try to describe uh, how you think about these mm -hmm. things. And to... Yeah, and so once you have uh, these uh, algorithmic representatives, just like in, uh, um, in democracy, uh, the representatives will then uh, vote uh, whenever there's a dilemma, whenever there's a, a new case of a, of a food donor that wants to give away food, 
the, the algorithmic representatives will vote to determine to where the food will go to. Mm -hmm. And the way they vote is well, through a voting system. Uh, the voting system they used in the paper is uh, called uh, the, the border uh, voting system. <coughs> so the, the border voting system is uh, a, a system in which you rank the different options. You say, well, this is my favorite option, this is my second favorite, this is my third favorite, and so on. Um, like I don't remember, but maybe they rank like the top 10 or something like this. And, and then you give points, like 10 points to the first option, 9 points to the second, and so on. Uh, and then you just add up uh, the, the scores and uh, the, the options with the most uh, votes, uh, the, the highest uh, number of points uh, wins. So this is the, the voting system used, for instance, for the, uh, the Ballon d'Or, the, the Golden Ball uh, Award in, in football. Okay. Um, yeah. And so the advantage of this is that it's uh, very uh, simple. So most people, f like, well, if you don't know anything about so social choice theory, I guess it sounds quite compelling. It sounds uh, maybe uh, like the way to go. Um, um, well, it's this, you know, there, are, there are caveats about this voting system, and we can talk about this later on. But what, what's nice is that most people felt it is that it, it, that it was fair and that it was something they would be willing to go with. And also, like just like in the case of algorithmic representatives, there was an interface to explain to the users mm -hmm. what were the impacts of the votes of their representatives, um, which, which is something, if you think about it, is quite nice. Like um, we don't really have that for, for representative democracy, at least okay. most countries in the world. Um, and this is also crucial to, for, for people to gain trust in the fact that the, the system actually took into account uh, what they prefer and that it's going to... Yeah, there's a lot of transparency along the way that's uh, okay. really, really nice and that it builds trust uh, so that pe pe people are actually using more and more the, this kind of, uh, of tools. Uh, and that was very, very nice. Yeah, as we discussed, so this one is very, very nice for transparency and uh, it can be trusted better in this sense. Uh, one way in which uh, it lacks is that it's, it doesn't have the property of uh, not being uh, possible to, to game the system. Mm. So by gaming, it would, it would be anyone that, instead of voting uh, its true preferences, would uh, vote something different than its true preferences for its own ad advantage. So for example, if you know that there are two options that are competing to be the, to be the best and you prefer one against the other, then uh, your optimal vote would be to put your preference at the first rank and even though it's not your last rank preference, the second uh, best option to put it at the very last rank yeah. to increase your chances of, uh, of influencing the vote towards uh, your true preference. Yeah. Yeah, it, it may seem uh, far-fetched, uh, but uh, and and like uh, like well, when I first thought about these ideas, I was like, well, if there are algorithmic representatives, then uh, well, th there's no no more this problem of gaming the, the social mm -hmm. choice. Uh, but when I thought more about this, and especially like reading one of the interviews, because well, they did the, the study uh, with well the actual uh, organizations and uh, and uh, like different like the the, the food donors and. The food recipients and uh, and the volunteers all get uh, uh, well, all participated in the in, in the the voting system and they all had uh, algorithmic representatives and they also had uh, like they decided to share the data like you 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 knew what other like the, what the volunteers mostly prefer, mm -hmm. what the others prefer, and there was this interview uh, where well, they also interviewed uh, all the participants uh, and there was this interview of. Um, of one of the participants, I don't remember in which category uh, she was, but she was saying something like, uh, it seems that people did not give enough fairness, importance to fairness uh, to me. Like uh, she, she was thinking that people should be giving more importance to, to, to fairness, and probably she did give a lot of importance to fairness, especially uh, helping people in, uh, in areas that are underdeveloped. And uh, you could think that if she thought longer about this, well, I don't know, maybe she already did, but you can imagine that if she, she thought longer about this, then she would train uh, more and more his, uh, uh, maybe her representatives to, to always pick the, the best option, uh, the, the, the option that's most uh, in, the, in the most uh, underdeveloped uh, mm -hmm. area. 
and then to give uh, to put in so, so that would be in the first place and and then on the second uh, like the, the, the third or fourth place and so on uh, she would put uh, everything that's very very remote very far <laughs> like stupid uh, recommendations so that in the end like the, this top choice of hers gets uh, 10 points more than mm -hmm, the actual mm -hmm. credible uh, alternatives yeah um, now that you say it it's uh, it's totally feasible with the with the system that they present uh, yeah. in the in the in the paper yeah yeah I, yeah like you pointed out yesterday uh, or two days ago uh, that uh, if you only use the machine learning model then it may be a bit hard to come up with this model. Actually, I think it's not because, for example, for features like uh, how long the car should drive, everyone has a slow, has a has a down, down slope. Yeah. Like the less driving, the better. So you would <laughs> very easily anticipate everyone else yeah. to to make the, the the bad choices in the front. You just make a positive slope for, for yeah. driving further is better, and and then you achieve exactly what you described. That your choice that is you just care about fairness more than others. Your choice about fairness would be first you put the very high score for this and everything else you put the reverse slope compared to what is uh, a normal thing and then you it, it, it would be a good approximation of uh, of the optimal strategy to gain the system yeah yeah maybe we should not say it <laughs> but, but no i think uh, like it's like saying like you build this system uh, and it's supposed to be secure and you're not saying anything about your system like uh, security by uh, opaque, opaqueness, like uh, as a black box, is not really safe. Like uh, uh, I think it's, it's better to, especially like we are at the beginning of this, uh, it's really important to, to better understand what all the flaws, in, in particular of transparency here. Yeah. Uh, I think transparency is high, like highly valued. Um, some, sometimes uh, it's a bit weird because transparency is highly valued, but privacy is also highly valued. So. Uh, they seem a bit, at least sometimes, in conflict, uh, and it's not easy. Like, you, and I, I think most of these systems, like, uh, like I would push rather for more transparency uh, because it's already very hard to build these systems, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I think it's better to analyze them uh, quickly, if possible, mathematically. But you also have to be aware that uh, because of this, uh, people are going to try to exploit the, the vulnerabilities of, of, of the system. And so in, instead of just being transparent and uh, assuming that everyone is going to be nice, I think the better option is to be transparent and to assume that everybody is not going to be nice and yeah, to be exactly. uh, resilient to, to this thing. That's a topic we discussed in the first episode uh, when we discussed about probing uh, black boxes. One, yeah. one disadvantage of making black box uh, transparent is that people would be have an easier way to game the, the, the yeah. black boxes. If you... Yeah. And, and this gives then a lot of importance to uh, to so-called strategy-proof social choice. So mm -hmm. social choice is like this voting uh, system theory, and uh, the the border system is not strategy-proof in the sense that people can game it. Uh, but there are like other uh, voting system uh, uh, that exist that are more resilient to this kind of attacks. Um, and uh, it was funny because, like, for, for the, the small story, like, so I actually worked on one of these systems, on the randomized Condorcet voting system. And uh, when I discovered it, discovered it, I was very excited about this. So I really promoted it uh, and was definitely my, my favorite voting system. Mm -hmm. uh, but then lately, uh, because of AI and stuff like this, I was like, uh, I was thinking that maybe it's not the right way to go because uh, the randomized Condorcet voting system is very good for in terms of uh, strategy proofness, but it it's not really like the the utilitarian choice because it's like more like uh, the majority decides. Uh, there are other flaws also because the computation time is quite large. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that very large. It's, it's polynomial in the number of options. So I guess in this case it could definitely be applied. But if you think about uh, the YouTube algorithm. Uh, if it has to choose between uh, 1 billion videos and the computation time is uh, n to the power 3, uh, well, 1 billion to the power 3 is yeah. too many. <laughs> okay. uh, but then you can, you can definitely have approximations of, uh, of the randomized Condorcet voting mm -hmm. system. Uh, well, yeah, so after reading this paper, uh, actually after the second time I read this paper, <laughs> Uh, I realized that maybe uh, this favorite system, voting system of mine may actually be again my favorite voting system and may be actually uh, relevant. Uh, maybe I should promote it more than I have been. 
in, in the last uh, few years. <laughs> okay. yeah. So, but what about what you said that uh, we it didn't maximize the sum of utility of uh, all the voters, but it would make the choice that satisfies the majority? Yeah, so uh, like, I guess the, the vanilla version of it should not be uh, the, the one, but I think we should try to build upon these ideas. Um, the, well, the problem is that if you usually don't include a, a, a principle of majority somewhere, uh, it's usually not going to, to be strategy proof. Like it's sort of like the, the trade-off usually, uh, but you need to better understand. So, so uh, one, one interesting thing about, uh, so, so I should say also, this framework has also been more or less applied to other settings. So there was uh, this paper about self-driving car dilemmas. Mm -hmm. There was another one about like kidney donation. Same problem, like you want to choose to whom you give the, the kidney or mm -hmm. whatever. The, yeah. And uh, um, what's interesting in the car, case of, of car di the dilemmas is that um, there are huge cultural differences. Uh, for instance, people in Japan want to save uh, the workers. Whereas uh, people in China want to save the drivers. Well, that's what came out of the data. Um, there are lots of caveats, but yeah. And so you can ask yourself, like, uh, how should self-driving cars actually be designed in mm -hmm. practice? Like, should we follow the Japanese uh, ethics or should we follow more the, the Chinese ethics? Uh, but what, what turns out to be uh, perhaps more re relevant is the fact is that you, you, you can take into account the fact that you can program different ethics in different cars and maybe you can have an ethics for a Chinese car in, in China and a Japanese ethics for Japanese cars. Um, and this would actually reveal the fact that uh, what happens is that uh, people in China probably have strong preferences about things that happen in China whereas things that happen in Japanese for Chinese people is, is less important. And I think we have the same sort of feeling uh, like, like here, for instance, in, in Switzerland, like right now uh, we care a lot about what I think, uh, this coronavirus, for instance, happening in, in, uh, in Switzerland, and it's harder for us to care about things that, that, that are uh, away. And in the, the voting system should probably try to, to capture this, like the fact that not all problems we don't care equally on all problems, like, and mm -hmm. we should give weight. And maybe if you start to introduce this and combine it with, uh, like, a weaker, like, a modified version of the majority principle, like maybe the majority uh, weighted by how much they care about this issue, then it starts to give something that seems uh, that has sort of like both the somewhat good properties of um, of of additive preference, like addition added. Mm -hmm. uh, adding all the preferences of other people, but also have this very important property of uh, strategy proofness. Okay. Um, but yeah, th yeah, that's like my intuition right now. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of research to be done. <laughs> and uh, yeah, after reading this, like after thinking about this, like uh, over the last couple of days, I felt like, I feel like maybe that's a research I could, uh, yeah. I could do. <laughs> so uh, in the in the paper, they didn't really have different problems that concern different people, but still, for the this one problem they were solving, food donations, they weighted differently. Um, they asked the participants whether it sh they should weigh differently the opinions of different uh, stakeholders, yeah. like the, the the people donating the food, the, the companies donating the food, the the, uh, the volunteers that drive the cars, the the member of the uh, of the association and then uh, most participants said yes the 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 weight in the votes of uh, different stakeholders should be weighted differently and they gave the most uh, most of the share of the votes to the the members of the association that were yeah. that because supposedly they they know more about uh, what's what's happening and they they are they are better place to to make a good decision yeah and uh, less weight <coughs> to uh, the, the food donors. Mm -hmm. And what's uh, interesting is that even the food donors uh, said this. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, uh, that, that's really interesting. I guess this is a prior vote on, <laughs> on, on who should vote. <laughs> uh, but did this vote, how was it weighted? <laughs> how do you weigh the vote about how to weigh votes? <laughs> <Good question. laughs> um, 
but yeah, that, that's interesting. Uh, that's really interesting because, um, like, suppose we wanted to, uh, well, I definitely want to to construct more and more these frameworks for all the more impactful uh, applications. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, for the YouTube algorithm, like, what should be recommended, what should be moderated on the YouTube algorithm, by the YouTube algorithm. Um, I think it's a big question and definitely, like, do not apply it. We build AI straightforwardly, like, there are lots of caveats. We've talked about a few already of them. Uh, but like I think we should aim towards this. Like I think it's a good, uh, it's an interesting framework. Um, and uh, if you do this, then the question of who votes gets is really important. Like it's really critical, and it's really not non-trivial. Like you, um, well, I guess one one very bad idea would be uh, one YouTube account, one vote. Mm -hmm. That would be a very bad idea because you can imagine a lot of bots creating a lot of uh, of accounts. Um, and, and then you can say maybe all uh, human that has a passport, or whatever, can 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 vote. Uh, but this still feels like uh, maybe it's not the best way to go. Like for instance, on questions like uh, like vaccines or, or right now like coronavirus, for instance, uh, should every video be every voter be given equally equal amounts of, of votes? Um, well, it's not clear to me uh, that it should be the case. Uh, and maybe if you ask people, maybe people will not answer. Uh, like, it's an interesting thing to do, at least to, 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 to ponder the, these questions, like who should be voting, mm -hmm. who should be given rights to vote. Uh, maybe it depends on topics. Um, yeah, I think it's a big research area as well. To, to, and it's actually the first time that I've ever seen this question raised, actually, uh, in, in an academic paper. Uh, to like main to, to people like because well, there are a few people mm -hmm. who have thought about like restricting the rights of votes at least on questions that require a lot of background knowledge to people who know better. And if you think about this, that's what's happening. Uh, like the, the like the, uh, the World Health Organization is more influential than uh, than many other people when it comes to health. And I think that's a, a very good thing. Uh, but. Uh, and so, yeah, this, this is the idea of epistocracy. Mm -hmm. So, literally, uh, epistocracy means uh, the power to knowledge, as opposed to democracy, which means the power to people. Mm -hmm. And uh, and at least in some areas, it seems that uh, epistocracy is uh, an interesting uh, way to go. Mm -hmm. um, if you think, of, for instance, of arguably one of the most reliable sources of information these days, Wikipedia. Uh, the Wikipedia page, for instance, on Trump is written by, uh, I think, about 200 or 300 people are responsible for 90% or 95% of the page. So most of it is due to a, a small uh, proportion of the, of the Wikipedia contributors. And, and that's probably a good thing uh, because they're doing a better quality uh, job because of this. Mm, yeah, I think this is a big question. Uh, yeah, when discussing uh, epistocracy, the only... Uh where I think that it could go wrong is that uh, the the people that are allowed to, to to vote or to influence the system more, they, they they might have different, very different preferences from the from the rest of the of everyone. In that case, they would uh, probably influence the system in, in the direction of their preferences, and that's where yeah. that's where it, it doesn't go well. Yeah, that, that's definitely a concern, and um, it's uh, actually something discussed in the paper as well. Um, the fact that, and, and more generally, like uh, whenever you're trying to to query data from people, uh, from people's preferences, it's very hard to have an unbiased sample of the world, mm -hmm. uh, simply because uh, like most research are not done in, in in India or China or there are many more people. Um, like the, you had the typically this problem for the for the web for the so the MIT had this website called Moral Machines where they post these uh, self-driving car dilemmas. And then there is the data, uh, but probably it was very biased data. Like people who actually responded to this kind of research, or probably people who have a strong interest in, in moral philosophy or in, in self-driving cars or in technology. Mm -hmm. And typically, what you can imagine is that Chinese people who answer this question are probably uh, wealthy people. Yeah. Uh, and same thing for Japanese people. So the reason why. Chinese wanted to save the drivers, and the reason why Japanese wanted to save the workers, maybe that. So maybe we, yeah, we don't even know if Chinese really want to save the driver more than uh, than the than the worker because 
uh, we only observed a very biased sample of uh, Chinese yeah. population. Yeah. And so there's also this challenge of, uh, so let's assume like for, for now at least that we wanted to give one person one vote. Uh, we would not be able to have an algorithmic, a precise at least algorithmic representative for every people. But, but what we might be able to do is to have, a, using a, a, like probabilistic inference, for instance, uh, you can have an idea of what a representative of a typical Chinese might be like by trying to get some data from some Chinese and trying to, to generalize and say maybe most Chinese are, are, are quite similar to this guy. Mm -hmm. um, and so there may be also ways using this algorithmic approach to unbias the 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 well the data collection bias uh, due to the fact that most people who respond are usually more wealthy and, and more informed, mm -hmm. um, and that would be also a research area that's uh, interesting. But uh, yeah, very, very interesting. Why why do you think that we can't have one algorithmic representative per person? Yep. I'm thinking that as we all have a smartphone, it could be that 10% of the hardware of my smartphone is. Is, a, is used for measuring my preferences and voting for me? Yeah, uh, so like, like you could do inverse reinforcement learning. Like this gets us to the, the dif difference, I guess, between uh, mm -hmm. preferences uh, and volition, or like at least, uh, well, so, so what, what was very interesting also in this paper is that uh, because of this, uh, well, just people get asked uh, a lot of ethical questions, it, get, it got people thinking about uh, okay. ethics, uh, and people actually changed their minds or evolved in the way they were thinking about these dilemmas as they were queried. Yeah. Um, and, and also, you could also show that they were biased by the way they were queried. Uh, it's essentially, like machine, the machine learning model approach, or the comparison-based approach, is uh, biasing people towards more emotional responses because uh, these are true cases, like they are shown. Mm -hmm. and maybe that was wrong to, to show true cases, like, uh, like they were not automatically generated. The uh, comparisons, uh, like if, from what I remember from the paper, like it yeah. was uh, like uh, they knew the organization, like uh, uh, they, they knew uh, the two options, like mm -hmm. oh yeah, I know, I've been there. Like, <laughs> and if you include this, uh, you, you, yeah, you're going to get more emotional. You're going to think about the people. You're going to have these uh, these more. Yeah, emotional approach to, to answering the, this query. Whereas if you're trying to describe a, a, a process uh, through which to arrive to, you can arrive to a, a, a conclusion that depends on the features you are given, then you have a much, much more abstract approach to this yeah. kind of dynamics, probably more reflect, reflective as well. Uh, so this leads you to, well, they show that it, it leads to different uh, conclusions, and mm -hmm. people also like felt that it was leading to different conclusions. And yeah, I think like in terms of moral philosophy, this is like uh, this is amazing. Like you get people to actually think about moral philosophy, and to and you see people having this tension between different parts of their brains, thinking in moral dilemmas in different ways. Like uh, uh, you know, I thought it was very interesting for this as well. Yeah, in the end, a slightly higher number of uh, the participants found that the machine learning based uh, uh, representative was uh, better at predicting their own preferences yeah. compared to the to the rule based. But I guess it's because it was quite un complicated to to well design the rule base to do what what you wanted to do, while the machine learning rule was autom automated to. Predict your comparisons was better. Yeah, so, so uh, like I don't know exactly the detail of the rule-based uh, mm -hmm. algorithm, but um, like uh, I feel like essentially like it boils down to writing the. Well, you only have uh, six features. Like it's very simple. Like it's only yeah. six features, and so writing an algorithm is just giving weight to the different features. I'm guessing. Um, ah, yeah, and one thing important to mention is also that the the participant were not uh, familiar at all with a. Uh, Machine learning, yeah, with yeah, the yeah, data yeah, science, with the computer science, etc. Yeah, all of this. So somehow, it seems like a very difficult task to to tell them for someone who knows nothing about algorithms to tell them now train these algorithms that will take decision for you. Yeah. it's uh, it is very unintuitive yeah. at first. But uh, but they were quite surprised that the participant would uh, quite quickly understand these algorithms and uh, also by 
by seeing how the algorithm works, uh, somehow get to trust their, their representatives. Plus the fact that uh, I think at least one participant reported that after doing this experiment, they were looking at the real world uh, quite differently yeah. because they understand better now the concept of uh, algorithms taking decision uh, daily and on a daily basis. Yeah, like from um, like you can imagine that this is a paper for 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 designing AIs. And I think it's uh, fantastic already for this. But you can also regard this paper as a way to teach about algorithms. And, and, and moral philosophy all at once. Okay? <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. Like, people realized that, um, so there were interviews of people who, who said they, 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 they felt like it was more complicated than they thought, like it was a difficult problem. It got them thinking. Um, like, if you have uh, this kind of frameworks, I, mean, I, I personally would love to just play around with the, the software and, yeah. and to, to, to learn how I think. Like, it, it's also psychology. Like, <laughs> learning how, how you think about these problems like uh, uh, yeah i think it's a it's an absolutely brilliant paper and uh, the background of, of the of the the authors i think there were well most of them are, are computer scientists but there were also like social scientists and um, yeah i think this is absolutely amazing <laughs> uh, and you can think about like implementing this for educational purposes like uh, mm -hmm. you can definitely imagine uh, like if they have, maybe they do, I, I don't know, maybe if you have like a free uh, available uh, versions of the, the software. Uh, yeah, if I'm teaching uh, a class on, 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 especially on AI ethics, uh, yeah, I would definitely give this uh, as an exercise to, yeah, to just construct your own uh, preferences and uh, algorithmic representatives and just understand the social choice and understand, mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it seems great. Um, another topic we often discuss is the the notion of volition, yeah. which is that we we have things that we prefer right now without thinking much about it. But if we were more calm, if we do more, what how would our preferences change? Like what we would really prefer if we were smarter. And uh, and it seems that interacting with these algorithms gave the participant somehow. A step in the right direction from their preferences. We can we can even count at the at the first level there what they were doing before before these algorithms was implemented before we build AI. Uh, we saw later in the data that it was not very great for several biases they had. Then when they started using this uh, we build AI algorithms, they they must have been slightly better. And after interacting with it. They, after reflecting a lot more on what they should really prefer, they, they came up with a very different solution that was shown to have a lot less of the biases, the, the un, uh, undesired biases that they had before. And uh, so it seems like it's at least a step in the direction of computing the evolution. Yeah. I believe that this method uh, would still have a, a lot of human biases in it that uh, we don't desire, but we don't yet know what they are, otherwise it would be easy to, to remove them. And uh, so I think there are still uh, different techniques to use to really capture the volition of people instead of capturing their preferences. Yeah, and the interpretability of it is, uh, is going to be critical. Like if you want to deploy systems that we trust, mm -hmm. uh, even though they're supposed to compute our volitions, uh, like, like you can imagine uh, this algorithm that uh, you say, well, I prefer to give to this uh, charity uh, and because maybe it has some, like you've been there maybe, but you don't realize it's because you've been there that you want to give to this uh -huh. charity. And then the algorithm say, no, 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 no. Like if you thought longer, actually you would give to this charity. Uh, it's, it's quite, uh, yeah. And it's, a, it's not necessarily a problem with the algorithm. <laughs> yeah, like mm -hmm. you can think that it's a problem with the way people are thinking. Uh, so, yeah, the, the way I posed this uh, when I gave a talk about this a uh, few, few days ago is uh, th there's the problem of trusting, like we need to trust a lot of things when, uh, when there are these complex systems. You need to trust that the algorithmic representatives are, are well designed. You need to trust that the social, social, that the social choice mechanisms will be applied. Uh, and, and I gave the example like in, in democracy, uh, like in some democracy, we tend to really trust the way the voting system works. But in other countries in the world, uh, people from these countries, at least some people from this country, from these countries, don't trust the way the, mm -hmm. the voting works. So it's not easy. Uh, and then 
yeah, maybe you trust fully the algorithm, but uh, the input of the algorithm or your, what you say to the algorithm. And then you have to ask yourself, do you trust yourself? Uh, it's not that easy if you, thought, you think about this, like to trust yourself that, yeah, you're doing the right thing. Like theoretically, we tend to think, yeah, I'm doing the right thing. But if you, you, you talk about actual cases, uh, like, for instance, what should be communicated about the coronavirus or what, uh, wh whom to give to, do you trust yourself, really? Like, you, you ask mm -hmm. yourself, like, this, this is a prime of intellectual honesty. Like, uh, yeah, you sh should you really trust yourself? And then you also need to trust others, like, uh, because this is a social, like, this is a participatory framework, so the others' inputs are going to matter to what's going to be done in the end. And if you, you, this, if you want to trust the whole system, you also need to trust that others will be, will be thoughtful enough and will be, will be doing what, uh, yeah, will be mm -hmm. actually be thinking enough and uh, having the right amount of confidence and not being overconfident in wrong ideas. So we need to trust the whole thing, which it seems extremely hard if you think about yeah. this. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. And so, yeah, before, before, like, I think it's an amazing first step. I think I've stressed it, stressed it uh, enough. But if you want to, to get this deployed on large scale systems, uh, like the YouTube recommender systems, I think there's a huge amount of work still to be done. Um, uh, but I also think that uh, there's a lot of, so, so one question that is often raised uh, when I talk about these things is like, yeah, okay, this is all nice in paper, but like, will YouTube actually implement these ideas? Um, and I'm actually quite confident that uh, YouTube will be applying these ideas if there are better tools. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, I don't think we're there yet, but uh, because if you think about it, for YouTube right now, they're imposing their own ethics in their algorithms. And this is extremely dangerous for, for, for them as a company, because if there's a backlash, if there's something that goes wrong, they, they are the ones who get blamed. Yeah. And, and they can, yeah, if you follow Cambridge Analytica, well, you, mm -hmm. it can be very, very harsh, harsh for them. And, um, and if you want a, uh, an organization like this, that's, uh, if you work in this organization and want it to, to, to survive and, uh, and that things go well, it seems actually a good idea to outsource the, the ethics you have instead of a, of a company-driven ethics, to have a, a user-driven ethics. Because uh, if it does not work that well, you, you can just say, well, we were implementing hopefully the best algorithms proposed by academia to do these kind of things. And the, the, the ethics were user-driven, like we're not responsible for this. I think they would still be counted responsible. They uh, would definitely still be uh, <laughs> counted responsible, but arguably a lot less. Mm -hmm. like, uh, and but so what you imagine the, the user input would be, I prefer that the YouTube recommender system recommends that kind of video? Yeah, at some point, uh, like, ideally, I guess that would be more or less the case. Like uh, you can see uh, how, uh, like, yeah, yeah, ideally there should be a, a whole framework. Maybe the, the vote also should be uh, maybe a bit anonymized, but somewhat transparent, so at least the aggregation of the votes should be transparent. Mm -hmm. And uh, just that you, you better understand what are the forces that shaped the decision of the algorithm. Uh, maybe like if there were like, uh, if you could see that well, because of uh, the World Health Organization and maybe of other entities, well, this kind of vaccination video were more pushed forward. Uh, you can see that well, there was a subset of users uh, that tend to watch these videos and or these videos, mm -hmm. and they tend to push forward this uh, uh, the fact, these ideas, like the fact that this video should be better recommended. I think it would give more transparency. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, evidently also there's a huge uh, psychological uh, challenge here, like in trying to get people to think about the evolution, their, their, their inner preferences, trying to be more less overconfident and uh, yeah yeah so so one thing we we discussed yesterday is about who that nearly no one clicks on the video of who so it's not being recommended at all to yeah. anyone but if you ask people their preference about whether who should be recommended or not yeah we expect a large number of people would say yes this is yeah. something that's good to be recommended so somehow it's a difference between uh, how we behave on the platform so what we click on when we decide what to watch and what we would better want than the platform recommends. Yeah, 
Yeah, definitely. I think there's a, a lot of interesting research to be done about, uh, yeah, about the, the, the preference, the difference between uh, user behaviors. And if you do inverse, mm -hmm. reinforcement, inverse reinforcement learning, you're going to learn well, what people do on a daily basis and, uh, and, and the preferences that drive mm -hmm. them to do this. And that's not really what we want. And that's maybe not really what people want. Uh, but then you need to engage with them and you can do this comparison based uh, approach. But it's still going to be very emotional, especially if the examples are, are, are real life examples and things that people have lived through. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's this more abstract approach. Uh, um, and all of this should be better combined, uh, better understood. And also you ha should have more and more tools to, to design all of these things. Yeah, it's a huge mess right now, but uh, hopefully we can sort this out. Uh. Yeah, yeah. In any case, the the work they did uh, is quite uh, quite amazing. Yeah, it shows that uh, how to use algorithms to do more good. And yeah. uh, I always like that. Yeah, yeah. This is a fantastic paper. Mm -hmm. Strongly, strongly <laughs> recommend <laughs> reading it. Yeah, so thanks for watching this video. Uh, next time we're going to do uh, something a bit different. We're going to talk about uh, YouTube videos and especially the series of uh, Smarter Every Day about uh, social media manipulations, which is uh, very interesting with interviews of people from Facebook and Twitter. And uh, we hope uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>